Good evening, everybody, and thank you all for being here. This is going to be the last of our Draper After Dark series for 2018, and um, Dr. Preston could not be here tonight. He is taking some much needed vacation time. So he asked if I would please introduce our wonderful guest for the evening. He is the Director of University of Wyoming's Research and Extension Center in Sheridan and Associate Professor in the University of Wyoming Department of Plant Sciences. His research, teaching, and outreach programs focus on understanding long-term impacts of exotic plant invasion and on restoring rangeland ecosystems negatively impacted by invasive plants. He was previously Director of Stewardship for the Nature Conservancy in Wyoming he is the past president of the Wyoming section of the Society for Range Management, where he chaired the International SRM's Rangeland Invasive Species Committee. He's currently a member of the Greater Sage Grouse Rangewide Wildfire and Invasive Species Working Group, and is the founder of the Wyoming Restoration Challenge, and a founding member of the Northeast Wyoming Invasive Grasses Working Group. In 2015, outstanding early career weed scientist by the Western Society of Weed Science. So if you guys weren't here to hear about grass and cheatgrass, you should probably leave because you're going to be disappointed. Let me please introduce Dr. Brian Miller. Thank you, Bonnie. And I would just like to, like to thank all of you guys for being here. Uh, we, we were able to come over a little bit early. Uh, my wife Rachel and my three sons and tour the museum and, and I, I'm always impressed at the level of work that, that occurs from this part of the country um, and, and I'm very happy and excited to be able to come talk with you guys about something that I have spent a long time learning about um, but that I still know very few answers about to be completely honest with you um, and so if you will if you will indulge me for for just a moment uh, I've got three little boys in the back of the room, and they always tell me that a good story starts with once upon a time. And so uh, to, to kind of give you an, an overview of what we're going to discuss tonight, I'm going to start with once upon a time. And I'm going to say once upon a time, there was a, a family that was fairly well uh, established in an area. They had a beautiful home that they loved, and they had been, uh, they had been settled in, and they become part of that community. And they got along with their neighbors and everything was working out very well um, and just go ahead and skip to that and we'll, we'll come back to that in a minute but um, there, were, there were some new folks that moved into the neighborhood and this is not a political story uh, but there were some new folks that moved in the neighborhood and uh, they had a different way of doing things and they kind of snuck in slowly at first and their numbers began to increase and they continued to become more and more involved in that community and, and implement changes in the way that they felt like things should be done. Um, it, it went so far uh, as to the, where they stole resources from the families that had been established in that community. And then they went as far as to burn their houses down. And the families in the community uh, turned back around. This is a tragedy, by the way. Uh, the families in that community uh, they, turn, they turned back around and they began to rebuild those homes and just about the time that the resources were coming back and the homes began to be rebuilt, the newcomers burned their houses down again. And uh, this is a terrible story, but as we work through uh, this, this case study, this series of, of discussions that we're going to have tonight, it's very analogous to something that is happening across the sagebrush grasslands of the western U.S. and it seems a little bit sensational and it sounds really terrible uh, but in many cases this type of thing not necessarily with humans uh, but this type of thing is occurring right before our very eyes and we may not be noticing it so we're gonna that's our outline for tonight's talk and so I'm gonna introduce you uh, to the original homeowners and then we're gonna talk about the newcomers a little bit and then we're gonna talk about some of the impacts that those newcomers are having on those landscapes and then we're going to have a little bit of a silver lining and talk about some opportunity and some hopeful stuff to set things back in order a little bit. So uh, if, you're, if, you, if you're okay with that, that's where we're going to go. And then every good story I'm supposed to say the end. So that's the end of this, of this part of the story. Um, so this is me. Thank you, Bonnie, for the, for the great introduction. It sounded a lot more impressive than it is. Um, basically, I get to spend a lot of my time trying to figure out 
how to fix broken rangelands. And it's a huge problem. Um, and, and hopefully you'll begin to see a little bit as we work through tonight. And, and it's also a great opportunity because I've had a, a great chance throughout my career to this point to learn a lot about not only how to help conserve the values of rangeland ecosystems, but also to try to help improve those to provide ecosystem goods and services to the people that benefit from those systems. So uh, that's kind of where we'll go tonight. If you're not interested in that, you can feel free to get up and leave. I will not be offended. So this is, this is what we're talking about. We, uh, this entire series has kind of tied in one way or another to sagebrush grassland ecosystems. Am I right, Bonnie? This, this. And so for those of you, how many, how many of you this is your first uh, talk in this series? Okay, so well, quite a few of you. So we're going to talk a little bit about sagebrush grasslands. Um, it's a really unique ecosystem. It's actually um, a system that, that, depending on how you measure it, is largely imperiled due to a number of different threats. Uh, it's unique in that the timing of precipitation that drives the vegetation communities on these systems is largely occurring during the dormant season. We get a lot of snow. We don't get a lot of growing season precipitation. And so shrubs, like you see here, uh, predominantly sagebrush and, and a couple of other uh, smaller magnitude of shrubs are, are, are the primary woody plant component in these systems. Um, it's dry enough that it's not completely grass dominated. It's, not, it's dry enough that we can't really support the growth of, of timber, of, of forest. And, uh, and the, the seasonal precipitation pattern means that, that things have to be relatively well suited to dry hot summers. And sagebrush just happens to be really well suited to that. Uh, it's got a really interesting root structure, There's some, some, some great research out of Utah State University from probably three decades ago that talked about this, this really neat thing about sagebrush called hydraulic distribu redistribution. So it's got an hourglass shape to its root structure. It's got deep roots, then a primary tap root, and it's got shallow roots where it can actually take water from deeper in the soil profile and pull it up and redistribute it closer to the surface and can potentially benefit other plants with which it coexists. Um, it's not completely an altruistic thing and we can't really personify plants, but those other plants do benefit from, from neat things such as this. I, my title was talking about the sagebrush sea. It's sort of a poetic description of these vast expanses of rolling hills dominated by sagebrush. And I think this picture kind of illustrates why. Right? If you squint a little bit or if you're sitting in the back of the room, you would potentially confuse this for a rolling sea or an ocean uh, with kind of a gray tint to it. Uh, this is just a map of the distribution, primary distribution of, of two different uh, subdivisions of sagebrush grasslands in the western U.S. Uh, the northern and the sort of um, northeastern tier, uh, some folks would call sagebrush steppe. It's characterized by smaller individual sagebrush plants with more continuous perennial grass understory. And then the south and west facing uh, oriented locations are more of a big, big great basin type sagebrush. Uh, larger plants, uh, more spatially distributed, more sp interspaces in between those plants, and a lot more bare ground that's not covered by perennial grasses or other forbs or other shrubs. Uh, this, this will become more important as we begin to talk through this, but, but bare ground typically uh, equates to the potential for, for resources that are available to other plants. And you can see that it's a, a large part of the western U.S that is considered to be part of the sagebrush grassland biome or sagebrush ecoregion. It's particularly important for a number of different species that depend on sagebrush itself or the suite of associated species that live within a sagebrush community. Uh, the, the golden eagle that, that is kind of the center for the exhibit that's going on now and a number of species that it depends upon and are associated with it are uniquely tied to the sagebrush ecoregion, and part of that is because of the shrub component and the structure that is available in these systems. Not to mention the sage grouse. Um, I would be really surprised if anybody in the room is not at least somewhat familiar with the sage grouse. If you live in the western U.S. and you haven't heard of the sage grouse in the last 10 years, 
you've probably had your head in the sand. Um, uh, one single species has probably not impacted as many different acres. Uh, the, the magnitude of, of affecting management practices, conservation, energy development, ranching, um, other uses of the land uh, that has a, than has a sage grouse in a number of years. And, and it is truly a species that, that um, influences management practices that then influence the potential for other species to persist and coexist on the landscape. And it is strongly dependent on, on sagebrush ecosystems. I mentioned that these ecosystems are uh, threatened and that we have lost um, a, a large portion of high quality sagebrush communities. Uh, this is one example. Anybody want to take a guess of where somewhere like this is? It's a Google Earth shot. Anybody say Pinedale? Um, so this is this is a, a situation that we have to deal with frequently in our part of the country. All right. So this uh, this this could be this could represent a number of different types of land uses. Uh, this picture happens to be oil and gas development uh, on the on the Jonah Field just outside of Pinedale. Uh, it could just as easily uh, look like exurban small acreage development where larger tracts get subdivided up into multiple ownerships and each of those different plots uh, is, is a house and, and a horse pasture potentially um, if you want to think about it as such. So these threats are really obvious, they're really clear to see on the landscape. They interact with our primary species of interest tonight outside of the sagebrush um, the three sagebrush subspecies in that this kind of surface disturbance uh, really opens these sagebrush plant communities up to invasion by non-native plant species. And, uh, and that's, that's the primary thing that we're going to talk about as a threat tonight. And, and, and to put it in perspective, um, when we think about sage grouse habitat if you look across the range of threats uh, to the sagebrush grassland communities tied directly to sage grouse uh, the number two threat to sage grouse persistence and sage grouse habitat uh, is is invasive annual grasses which is what we're going to talk about tonight anybody know what number one is well so cheatgrass absolutely for for invasive annual grasses but so if, if they're the number two threat then does anybody want to take a guess what number one is people it's direct habitat destruction right it's it's kind of I mean if you're destroying habitat by putting parking lots or something in then um, it's hard to compete with that right so we're gonna talk a little bit more about why about why these invaders why these new critters that are moving in potentially have such an impact uh, on these systems so these are the primary four that we're gonna talk about tonight uh, if we're in a different venue I might make you guys take a quiz right now but I'm not going to ask you to do that um, so the the primary you guys talked about cheat grass which it's probably the poster child uh, so the upper right that's green there you see those open finger like inflorescences uh, that are so indicative of cheat grass or downy brome uh, bromus tectorum is a scientific name I'm going to just introduce you to these three, these four actors, and then we're going to talk a little bit about their biology that, and why they're a problem. And I'm going to try to keep an eye on the clock because as some of you know that I could probably talk about this for like six hours, and I don't want to keep you guys here that long. Uh, so a very closely related species in the bottom left, Japanese or field brome. It's in the same genus as cheatgrass, Bromus. It's Bromus arvents. Uh, we we do have it pretty widely distributed throughout the state of Wyoming. It seems like it, it uh, primarily is more of an impact as we start to transition into the Great Plains ecoregion where sagebrush starts to play out as we move east. Uh, Medusa head grass, which is in the upper left-hand corner, and Ventanata grass, which is in the lower right. Until uh, 2016, we did not think we had either of these species persisting in the state of Wyoming. and. Um, as part of a graduate student research project, we documented both of these in Sheridan County in 2016, and I'll talk a little bit about that at the end. Um, forage value for both livestock and wildlife, pretty poor. Uh, early in the growing season when they're green, 
uh, something like cheatgrass. A lot of people don't know this, but one of the reasons why it's called cheatgrass greens up really early at the at the end of winter, right? If you guys pay attention to this, and and in some instances it was considered that it helped both livestock and wildlife at the end of hard winters cheat death because they were able to have a relatively nutritious forage in an early growth season. It's not all bad, and that's one of the things that we'll talk about, but the net effects of these species is, is primarily bad. Um, the two new guys, Medusa head and Ventnata, their, their forage quality um, pretty much non-existent. And in fact, uh, livestock typically will avoid them, and there's some reports from states farther west that they reduce forage quality by up to 70% uh, on, on any given acre where they have dense infestations. These plants are primarily winter annuals, which means if we get sufficient moisture in the fall, like now, you guys have been getting a little bit of rain, a little moisture over this way, maybe some snow. I know we got some in Sheridan in the last few days. They will go ahead and emerge from the seeds that were produced this year and they will spend the winter as relatively small seedlings. That's the same for all four of these winter annual grasses. Uh, cheat grass has been documented to elongate roots um, at just above freezing. So if you think about it, they might actually be growing a little bit underneath the snow when they have insulation uh, at which they can grow. As the snow melts in the spring, these guys are sitting there ready and waiting to grow and, and take up that early spring soil moisture that is largely recharged by fall and winter precipitation. And so uh, the other reason why, why cheatgrass spe specifically and these other species might be considered cheaters is that they start their period of active growth much sooner during the year than most of our other desirable perennial plants. And so they take that soil moisture and they deplete the soil moisture uh, that our perennial plants are not able to use thereby competing for limited resources, to go back to our introductory story, taking those resources from the, the resident community that has been there for a long time. Um, they're annuals, and so they only reproduce from seed, meaning that they do not invest a lot of uh, high energy resources in structures or in root growth. And it also means that they can, in dry years, they can be about this tall and still produce seed. Their entire life is about pr producing seeds so that they can come back from year to year, which is much different than many of our resident perennial grasses. So they're particularly well adapted to stress, and they're particularly well adapted to dry conditions, and they're fairly well adapted to cold conditions, um, which kind of makes them pretty well suited for a lot of our country in this area. Um, this, is, this is some of the, the things that we might see. So. Uh, the other thing that, that might be said about these, about these winter annual grasses, so if, if I grow early in the year and if I dry out, if I produce quite a bit of biomass and then I dry out in late May some years, early June, when do we get a lot of our uh, lightning thunderstorms that come through the area? Midsummer, right? Convectional thunderstorms. So these, the other thing that has been said about this suite of annual grasses I guess to continue, even though we're not supposed to personify, uh, is that they're actually tool users. So there is a there is a wildfire annual grass cycle that perpetuates itself when we get fuel loads that look like this, primarily driven by very fine structured fuels uh, that these annual grasses make up. Um, we go back to our our sort of target non-target. Well, our, our primary desirable species that we're talking about tonight, that is the, the big sagebrush species. Uh, does anybody know how well the three big sagebrush subspecies respond to repeated wildfires? I'm getting a big thumbs down from up here in the front of the, in the, front of the room. So they do not re-sprout, and so they have to reproduce from seed. And they're kind of wimpy competitors as seedlings. And I could say the same thing about an individual cheatgrass or an individual Japanese brome or an individual medusa head plant. They're not very good competitors by themselves. But when you have billions of their buddies in one place and they're able to deplete those resources very quickly, 
after a fire that those plants are primarily uh, responsible for um, perpetuating, fueling, and continuing, uh, then we're at serious risk for losing the sagebrush component from these rangeland ecosystems. So uh, the way that this that a typical year in, in cheatgrass would look like, this is a fire down in the Ferris Mountains. Um, this, this was actually taken in late May. It's already starting to turn purple, already starting to dry up and become a fire risk. This is from Fremont County. This was taken at almost 9,000 feet. For a long time, we thought that, that these annual grasses were not going to be a problem in our higher elevations. We've come to find out that such is not the case. It's already started to turn purple. Once it begins to reach this stage, palatability for both wildlife and livestock drastically diminishes in that it really no longer provides any, much, any food source for any of these grazing animals or browsing animals that might use it. Picture from the other side of the basin over around Thermopolis kind of country down on that Black Mountain fire that burned multiple times. Uh, we see pretty clearly the old fire scar where this bright yellow cheatgrass has already cured out and we see that we've lost the sagebrush on this site uh, because it was unable to respond to the fires that burned in that area. So if I'm an annual plant and I respond very well to fire and I come back from seed every year, uh, then I'm very flexible in my ability to come back after a severe disturbance event. And these plants are actually facilitated by disturbance, whether it be uh, new road development, whether it be mismanaged grazing for a long term, or whether it be continued fires. So this, this picture would have been taken in, in September, uh, quite a few years ago. And just to kind of walk you guys through uh, what I was talking about earlier, you dig down underneath that litter after we get a little bit of fall moisture, uh, this, is what, this is what we would begin to see. So there's a carpet of new cheatgrass seedlings. How many of you guys thought that these baby seedlings like this would make it through a winter and, and not freeze if they came up and started growing this time of year? We're going to talk a little bit about how tough these guys are. Um, and there's some of you in this room that would, would be able to talk about this probably as well as I would, if not if not better, but um, they can they can withstand even these small seedlings a uh, tremendous amount of stress and still maintain their growth and their ability to come back from that stress. And I'll give some credit to Will Rose, who's faculty at Northwest College. This is a picture of his. He was doing some really interesting research not too long ago, trying to figure out how to trick cheatgrass into germinating so that we could purify some native seed that we were using for reclamation purposes and and he got these are just germinated cheatgrass seedlings and he was able to to get them to germinate and we thought we could uh, stress them out let them dry out put them on a lab bench and sit out in Laramie which is pretty dry uh, for about two months and that they would die but it just so happened that uh, a large portion of these these seedlings uh, that were basically in a tub like this and didn't have any any kind of, of uh, insulation or any kind of soil moisture around them after being dry for almost two months, uh, when we introduced water back to them, they just decided they would go ahead and start growing again. Um, so so in, some, in some cultures, your, your valor is kind of uh, evaluated by the, the strength of your enemy. And even though these are kind of wimpy little annual grasses, uh, it's a pretty, it's a pretty hard enemy to try to deal with and try to figure out uh, um, what we're trying to do with these plants. So this is just a, a, a picture that, that I took in one location where um, we, we can talk a little bit about uh, how these plants are adaptable. You move from left to right, you see a very small cheatgrass seedling and then, and then a, a, a plant that's much more well developed. Uh, they can germinate at different flushes even on the same site within a year. So if you think about trying to, to manage a plant like this, if we think about it from uh, a, an undesirable perspective, which I think some of the things that we've discussed up to this point would convince us that it might be an undesirable plant, um, the fact that you can, whatever the method may be, if you went to your, to your backyard and you hand-pulled a bunch of this cheatgrass because you didn't like it, 
uh, and you get sufficient moisture, then you can actually have another flush from the seed bank that persists. It's very difficult to manage seeds that exist underground, and, and this is only one of the challenges that we have. Um, as I'm talking about the biology, I'm, I'm thinking back to, to the fact that I probably skipped over a very important point in that uh, some of the, the, the most recent data would suggest that there's potentially up to 60 million acres in the western U.S. that has some proportion of, of winter annual grasses that are affecting the resources on that site. That's a lot. Anybody know how many acres there are in the state of Wyoming? There are 93,000 square miles. You're exactly right. No, it's 90, 98,000 square miles, I think. So if we, if we convert that to acres, there's about 63 million acres in the state of Wyoming. So y if you think about the, the estimates, um, if you put it, if you, the entire state of Wyoming would be completely covered by these annual grasses if you think about how many there are throughout the sagebrush biome. That's kind of a hard thing to swallow. Um, how did they get here <laughs> is one of the questions that we always get asked. And I would say the most accurate answer is we don't really know. Uh, the, the, the most commonly cited transportation and introduction uh, pathway for cheatgrass in, in particular is that it was, it was uh, introduced in packing material when there was a big expansion from what was uh, most recently kind of those former Soviet bloc countries. So packing material, do you think they had packing peanuts in the late 1800s? They used straw and things like that. And then so when when Grandma brought her dishes to this part of the country from uh, from Central Asia or from, from Eastern Europe, they packed them in straw. And there were seed contaminants of cheatgrass that was introduced to the West Coast. And from there it spread. First uh, record of cheatgrass in the state of Wyoming was in 1907. First documented, collected record. So we've had it for a long time. Uh, but our, our management strategy was in some ways that we were kind of immune uh, because of, our, because of our, our overall climate and habitat. Um, I think that we could easily say that such is not the case. Um, it's hard to see. I wasn't sure what the room was going to look like. I'll just give you a quick rundown on this. Basically, the take-home message is that the more cheatgrass we have, the lower number of species that we see on a site. This is from some recent research that a graduate student of mine, Clay Wood, did. Looked at a number of sites across the x-axis going from left to right as an increase in the amount of cheatgrass on the site. And then the y-axis is species richness, so the number of species that correlate to that level of cheatgrass. This is not really uh, groundbreaking new information, but if we're concerned about species diversity, that leads to resilience to stressors in these systems. And if we're losing the number of species on these sites in correlation with an increased number of something like cheatgrass, then it's something that is a call for concern even beyond these other issues related to fire. I'm gonna walk you guys through this at risk of getting a little bit too detailed. And then, and then, then um, we're gonna move on to a few other things. So this, that, this is that wildfire cycle that I was gonna tell you about. And the point of the next three slides that I'm gonna show you is that um, I think a lot of people think that this should be an easy thing to fix. It's a weed problem. Go out there and control your weeds. It'll take care of itself. Um, so if you're not familiar with this kind of systems diagram, basically two things that are linked by an arrow shows that they're a relationship. A plus next to that arrow means that a change in the magnitude of one of those items changes the next item in the same direction. So an increase in annual grasses leads to an increase in wildfire frequency. See how you can interpret a diagram like this? An increase in wildfire frequency leads to a decrease in perennial plants on a site, specifically things like sagebrush. And then we know that a decrease in the number of perennial plants on a site can then make that site more susceptible to continued invasion by other annuals or other noxious weeds. It's a, it's a, it's a vicious cycle if you've heard that term. Um, so it's a little more complex than that. And we'll start talking about why in that there's a relationship between litter and cheatgrass germination and establishment. Uh, so the more litter that these plants produced, 
they actually establish and persist better in, in a situation where there's litter. And they produce high levels of litter in years where we don't have fire. So they have an increased establishment and in persistence that can then lead up to an increase in summer fuels that can fuel that increase in the potential for wildfire that can then lead to an indirect increase in more annual grasses. Now what do we do in a situation like this? We start looking at externalities or things that might impact the system and we start thinking about grazing and herbicide or browsing by livestock. You see that this thing gets incredibly complex and this is only a small part of an ecosystem that's impacted by invasive grasses. It's a wicked problem that becomes very difficult to think through, especially when you start thinking through socioeconomic factors like how fire affects communities, like uh, lack of ability to think through how you can damage a target plant like this, yet maintain your, your desirable species, and then social acceptability of things like prescribed fire in places where we've already lost sagebrush or the use of different methods such as herbicide. Take home message from some really crazy looking mixed up graphs is if it were an easy problem, we wouldn't have 60 million acres of it, right? And I would argue that when we have something with that large of a footprint, that this is probably one of the largest environmental, agricultural, economic concerns that we have in the Western US. And there's a lot of people that just drive through the country and say, oh, look at those pretty purple hills. Right, so thank you for being here, although my guess is that many of you are already familiar with this and that's why you're here. So this is a more simplified thing. So this is the National Interagency Fire Council has put, some out, put out some uh, outreach information. So this is probably my level of thinking, right? This is, it's, like, it's kind of like caveman speak almost, but I have been living with toddlers for quite a few years now. So more fire leads to less sagebrush habitat that leads to more We'll say winter annual grasses, typically more cheatgrass, that leads to fewer sage grouse, right? That's a much more interpretable uh, systems diagram. And so when you think about the fact that all these things are connected, and then you take that downstream to the other wildlife, to the other uh, services such as water cycling or nutrient cycling, um, soil health that are potentially impacted by these things, um, it kind of starts to unravel pretty quickly for us. So the big question is, does fire equal cheatgrass? I think we've kind of established that, and I won't beat the dead horse too much. Um, we're starting to learn that it does not always equal cheatgrass, especially if there's some potential management follow-up after that fire, and there are some differences in seasonality of the fire. Um, when I work with land managers, I, I also remind them not to be complacent and not to think that if you go out there the year after the fire and you don't see cheatgrass, you're not going to have any. Uh, these are just some images from some work that we did uh, in the Wind River Range and where we went back and revisited some sites following a wildfire using some very large scale aerial imagery. You can see the insets from the two different images from 2008. Uh, 2003 was one year after the Pass Creek fire, which burned in 2002. No cheatgrass to be seen. It was pretty clean. And then after about a six-year lag, you can see that the, the levels of cheatgrass on that site elevated to, in some cases, greater than 80% cover. And so this relationship is pretty well established, um, and it's something that I think we've been acutely aware of the last few years, and I think uh, this year it's becoming even more uh, of an issue. This is just another satellite imagery of that same area. Uh, you can see on the right hand side you can easily see the persistent sagebrush and then on the left hand side of that fire line um, it's a little bit hard to see but you can kind of see that purpley orange tint in that we've basically lost all of our sagebrush and uh, and we've shifted that primarily to a cheatgrass dominated community now historically before cheatgrass was an issue uh, that sagebrush would have probably recovered within a period of 20 to 25 years back to a similar level to what it was before the fire. But with the introduction of these new neighbors, with these new folks in the community, uh, we have got systems that have shifted their fire regime from depending on what papers you read from potentially 50 plus years to natural historic fire return intervals, to places that are burning every three to five years in southern Idaho. Once the fire regime changes to that level, we're not getting sagebrush back. So I want to put a few quotes up. Um, 
You guys feeling down in the dumps yet? I'm not trying to bring the doom and gloom. We're going to talk about a little bit of stuff, um, a little bit, a little bit of positive stuff here in just a minute. So I listen carefully for clues whether the West has accepted cheat grass as a necessarily a necessary evil to be lived with until kingdom come, or whether it regards it as a challenge to rectify its past errors in land use. And I found the hopeless attitude almost universal. And then the second quote is, has anyone a practical method by which annuals, so primarily the grasses that we're talking about, can be replaced and perennials reestablished in a density which would permit us to say that the range had been brought back to its pioneer carrying capacity? Um, a pretty, pretty sad, pretty sad quotes, and I think they reflect the attitude in some cases that we hear these days. Uh, to put these into perspective, this attitude has been around for a little while. Um, and so we go back to uh, some, some really uh, highly intelligent people that have been thinking about this problem for a really long time, much farther than, than I have had the opportunity to think about it. Um, and we see that it has been a problem for our Western rangelands for a very long time. Um, we have made some progress, and I think we're gonna start talking a little bit about that. So. Our, our understanding of rangeland ecosystems have changed, and I'm just going to walk through this um, relatively quickly. I could almost teach a whole class just on this one slide. But So across the top from left to right, we've got increasing abundance of cheatgrass and, and what, uh, what would be a, a relatively natural progression from the time that it gets introduced until the time that it would become dominant on a site. Um, no cheatgrass on the left, nothing but cheatgrass on the right. Uh, so the way that we, we understand these systems now is that there's not a linear progression from, from bare ground to some predictable state. There are multiple different plant communities that can potentially persist on any given site. And those communities can vary a little bit. They can, they can kind of rattle back and forth depending on how stable and resilient they are to different stressors. But when we couple something like annual grass invasion with a significant um, either change in the disturbance regime or a significant change in the long-term climatic events, then it can actually push that into a different range of stability systems. We call it a different stability domain or a different steady state. Once it crosses over that thing that we would consider to be an ecological threshold, cheatgrass is now driving the way the system works. It has ceased to be driven by sagebrush grassland dynamics and it is now being driven by, by annual grass dynamics. Once it moves over into that state, it is really difficult to get it back out of. In fact, some of the folks that really started to develop this kind of theory, uh, they would stand in front of the room and say, you can dump all the dollars and fossil fuels at it that you want, and you're never gonna get it to change. Um, that's pretty pessimistic, so we're trying. Uh, there are some leverage points, and one of the ways that I feel like we're very uh, blessed in the state of Wyoming is that we have a lot of different parts of the state that are potentially susceptible to cheatgrass, but they haven't crossed over to the point where cheatgrass is driving the system. We've still got those perennial desirable plants are there. So some kind of management approaches that we might take trying to prevent these grasses from being introduced in the first place. Trying to maintain healthy, healthy sagebrush rangeland communities so that they're more resistant to this invasion as well are some of the things that we like to think about. There's, other th there's also this thought of if we can identify these ecological thresholds, can we implement some kind of management to keep them from crossing over to where annual grasses are driving the system? So just to, to, to give you guys an idea about susceptibility, another graduate student of mine, Kara Noseworthy, did a, a basically a habitat suitability model for the state of Wyoming. Um, as, as the color gets darker, the probability of successful establishment for cheatgrass increases. And so I if you get above white, it's greater than 50% that it would establish on these sites. Based on environmental characteristics, soil, uh, this does not really take into account land use practices. Um, it kind of goes back to, to reiterate that point that there are so many different acres, uh, such a vast quantity of places that are susceptible. Uh, but so, so we're working at the state level to think through this now and that if we know areas are susceptible to annual grass invasion, is there a way that we can be proactive, prevent them from becoming established, potentially try to reduce the wildfire risk uh, 
that's being fueled by these in invasive annuals and conserve that sagebrush habitat before we lose it. And this type of data helps us do that. Uh, there were a group of us that were curious about what the, the scientific literature told us about managing annual grasses, primarily cheatgrass. So we, uh, we basically reviewed every published paper that had ever been written about cheatgrass management in the, in the entire western U.S. Really, in, there we had three publications from Europe, I think, and, and we excluded those. Um, and you can kind of see that, that the research has been done in, in the sagebrush biome. And so we reviewed all these different papers, basically just asking the question of what has worked and what hasn't from an annual grass management perspective, both trying to reduce the annual grasses and an increase the desirable perennials. And this, this is uh, one of the figures that our team came up with. And I'm just going to focus on a few things to, to walk you real quickly through the graph. We won't spend a whole lot of time on it. Basically, if, if those little symbols are completely on the left-hand side of that center line, then it was a reduction in cheatgrass. If they're on the right-hand side, it, it actually led to an increase in cheatgrass in these research studies. So if you look at, at revegetation on the bottom, the dark, the closed square indicates short-term, so one year after the application of whatever this practice of revegetation was. And then the open square is two or more years. So if you look at this, at this figure overall, a lot of different practices, including burning, defoliation, which was either grazing or mowing, herbicide revegetation, some kind of soil disturbance, led to a short-term decrease in the abundance of cheatgrass. We start to look at long-term. There are really only two things that led to a longer-term reduction in cheatgrass. And this is across hundreds and hundreds of independent studies. And those were uh, the use, I will say the appropriate and proper use of herbicide and, and revegetation. And, and long term, the longest study that we have for data collection was only about five years after the initial treatment. So it's really not long term. So uh, the, the, the thing that we have to really think through when we're looking at this is that as we start to actively try to manage something like these invasive annual grasses, any individual management technique that we take, that we, that we enact, that we implement, is likely on, only going to last for a few years before those annual grasses recover to a point that is similar to what we, we did, what they, we had prior to the management action. They're tough, they're tough to get rid of. Um, Another, we'll go back to some more of Will's work. I should just let you come up here and talk a little bit. Uh, Will worked with BLM uh, to, to kind of do an evaluation of, of cheatgrass seed contaminants in native seed purchases that were used for uh, oil and gas reclamation, wildfire rehabilitation, and, and he found that there was an astoundingly high number of cheatgrass contaminants in these seeds that we were using to try to reseed rangelands to protect them from further cheatgrass invasion. And so um, there, are, there are these other sort of uh, entry points that I think that we have to be aware of and we have to really think through a lot of our land use practices uh, to, to, to really move the needle when it comes to cheatgrass. About grazing. Have you ever thought about using grazing as a tool to reduce something like cheatgrass, annual grasses? Some folks would consider this much more environmentally friendly than using chemicals. Um, as I mentioned earlier, it's a pretty good food source early in the spring. So uh, another student spent a lot of time following sheep and cows around, putting them in pretty tight, confined areas and, and encouraging them to graze cheatgrass. And what did we find? So don't, I'll pre say, be prepared for this very highly um, data-driven figure that you're about to see. I apologize for the sophistication of this figure. So I, I mentioned earlier, seed, this is all about seed production from year to year. So, uh, so Kara, again, she looked at, at, if we did nothing, did absolutely nothing to these sites that were highly impacted by cheatgrass, um, they were producing about 200 pounds of cheatgrass seed per acre. You wrap your mind around that a little bit. For those of you that have done any kind of rangeland reseeding projects, we usually seed perennial grasses at like 10 pounds per acre. 
So it's a tremendous amount of seed that's being produced. If we only grazed in the fall, and it didn't matter if it was sheep or cows or cows and sheep together, we only grazed in the fall, there was a tendency that those cheatgrass plants actually produced more seed the following year than they did if we didn't do anything to them. Spring or spring plus fall grazing, we reduce that seed production by roughly half. And then two herbicides that have been used widely, uh, for some reason, IMAZ, which is a Mazepic, it's sold as Plateau, which has probably been the most widely used herbicide for annual grass control, completely failed in this study. And it just looked like we fertilized it. Things happen sometimes. And then Remsulfuron or Matrix basically led to absolutely no seed production and no negative damage to perennial grasses. So it's really tough. There's this strange sort of love-hate relationship with grazing and annual grasses and that to get to move the needle on seed production, um, you have to graze it sufficiently heavily enough to impact those plants to where they can't recover and produce seeds, but you have to remove that grazing pressure before you negatively impact your perennial grasses that are on the site as well or your other desirable plants that are there. It's a complex relationship. So I'm going to touch very briefly on this. We do a lot of work trying to understand how to properly use herbicides. It ties back to the fact that, as you saw from an, uh, reviewing hundreds of studies, whether it's palatable to you or not, this is the one method that we have that consistently works to eliminate or at least reduce annual grasses. There's a site down by Casper that had burned a number of different times. You can see our white stakes that are there. Uh, I could say that uh, very confidently because we collected a lot of data, all the green stuff that shows up in those squares in these plots are desirable perennial grasses and some shrubs that were able to persist. The brown stuff in those plots were either chemicals that didn't work at all or those were <laughs> they were controls where we didn't apply anything. Uh, this, is a, this is another sort of close-up of some work that we've been doing recently with a, with a newer uh, experimental herbicide. And you can see on the right, in, in an area that was non-treated, uh, it looks pretty flammable, doesn't it? It looks like it's ready for one lightning strike and it's going to carry a fire through there. Whereas on the left, a little bit more bare ground, but the perennial plants that were there uh, recovered very well um, and actually produced more than the perennial plants that were on the right where we did not remove the cheatgrass. And if there was a, a common theme that we've seen through years and years of doing this kind of research in areas that are highly impacted by cheatgrass, we have seen from uh, anywhere from a two-fold to a six-fold increase in perennial plant production following the removal of annual grasses on a site. You think about what that translates to from an economic perspective or from a wildlife habitat perspective, that's, that's pretty amazing. Now this was actually taken three years after a single application of this new herbicide that's called indazaflam. Is it a silver bullet? No way. There is no silver bullet with a situation like this. Is it something that might help us move forward? Um, I, would say, I would say that we're learning more and more about how to use it. Uh, I'm just going to touch a little bit on this. It's the same curve. And I, and I mentioned those increases in perennial grass uh, production. Uh, if we look at, at the ratio of perennial grasses to annual grasses moving from left to right, uh, there were several of us that were thinking about this a lot. And at some low density level, if, if you remove those annual grasses with whatever method that you choose, you're not going to see an increase in the production of your perennials because they're not suppressed by the competition from those annuals. There's probably some optimum level of return where you've got enough annual grasses that they're suppressing your perennial plants that if you can remove them from the system, you're going to see this great flush of, of perennials. And we went out, a uh, graduate student of mine, Clay Wood, went out and collected a lot of data on sites like this. This is down by Saratoga. Uh, we collected cheatgrass, perennial grass cover um, every 50 feet across these relatively large sites. So we ended up with these grids, and we could map out cheatgrass density um, and, and cover. And you can kind of see that, that our data match pretty well with what a landscape scale picture looked like as we moved back and where we mapped it from our data. And this is, this is a site uh, that is over by Pinedale from that same project. 
and, and the oranger, the warmer values show higher annual grass cover. Uh, the non-treated site in the center uh, stays pretty warm, uh, both from pretreatment all the way through two years after application of some herbicides. And we see that, especially in that first year after, uh, we saw a tremendous reduction in, in that annual grass cover. And then after the second year, uh, it was still reduced, but it started to recover. But, but the primary point of interest in, in Clay's research was trying to understand where some of these thresholds exist where it actually makes sense. If we've got thousands of acres of cheatgrass, we can't control all of it. Where does it actually make sense to go invest some money? It's going to be a little bit hard to see from the back of the room, but this was increase in perennial grass biomass, so perennial plant production following removal of cheatgrass on these sites. And so the, the, the brown color basically stayed flat after we treated it, we, well, after from, from year one to year two because we didn't do anything to it. We saw no increase in perennial grass. And then uh, this line is very similar to what we hypothesized would occur based on some of our earlier knowledge. And so there's some kind of sweet spot in there around two and a half to three to one uh, of cheatgrass to perennial grass cover where we start to see a benefit from doing some kind of, of control. And so up until this point, we haven't had these, these benchmarks, these decision-making points. It's just been either do we have cheatgrass or do we not, and do we want to control it or do we not? Um, and many times the control happens after the fire. So we've already lost our sagebrush component. So we're trying to be a little bit more proactive in how we do those things. So I wanted to, I wanted to end with a positive note. As we get way out there on that end of the spectrum um, where there is nothing but cheatgrass left, what do we do? Uh, if we can control it, there's, there's oftentimes nothing there to recover. And so there's a number of folks around the western U.S that are doing work on how can we adequately suppress these annual grasses and reestablish desirable plants. And this is from a, a research site down in northern Colorado uh, where in the foreground you see all this mat of litter. That's, uh, that's what cheatgrass looks like in late, in, in late summer. And then in, in the background you can see these different strips of native grasses, forbs, and there's actually some shrubs in there that we've been able to get reestablished and, and this is one site of a number of cooperative sites uh, that we've been able to come into those places that were completely dominated by annual grasses and reestablish desirable diverse mixtures of species. Now can we do this consistently and every time? Not yet, but I think this is pretty good evidence that we are moving that direction and if we go back to some of those quotes from people like Aldo Leopold or Charles Fleming, I think the answer is beginning to change and that we are learning how to do this a little bit more. So with that, I went a little bit longer than I intended, but I thank you for your attention and uh, I, I thank you for being here. And if there, I don't know if we have time for questions, Bonnie. If we do, I am happy to try to Okay, I'm, ha I'm happy to try to address a few. Thank you. We're also going to be having a cash bar upstairs, so if you guys would like to ask any uh, questions up there as well, you are welcome to do that for a little bit. So My answers might change depending on how much you That's guys right. drink. <laughs> Man. That's a fantastic question. If you guys didn't hear it in the back of the room, and, and it's native range where cheatgrass came from, are there are there native are there natural enemies or controls or pathogens or things that keep it in check there? Um, yes, and so that's that's one of the things that that we we try to learn more about, um, and that's a pattern that we see with most of our invasive plant species is that they're kind of well behaved in their native range. And then some of them that get introduced into a new area, they kind of just go completely crazy. Um, there's at least 18 different hypotheses for why that occurs, and that's not an exaggeration. We go through all those in a class that I teach. Um, but one of those is, is uh, natural enemies 
hypothesis, re enemy release hypothesis. So when when Grandma brought those seeds over way back in the 1800s, she did not bring those natural enemies with her. And so those plants were released from pathogens, from insects, from diseases that may have potentially kept them in check in their native range. The other thing that I think we have to think about is that uh, some of these plant communities have existed on these on these sites for who knows how many years. So there's been this continual sort of coevolutionary relationship between these species that have grown together for however many years they've been there. And so they've been able to work out this sort of balancing of competitive abilities or or they avoid competition by growing at different either different soil depths or different times of year. So um, yes, they behave themselves. The natural follow-up is could we potentially go back there and find some of those enemies and bring them here and use them for biocontrol agents. That's classical biological control that has been very successful with some species. Uh, leafy spurge, flea beetle is a great example of that. It's kind of been a wreck with some other species, especially back in the day before we were really strict about making sure that they only fed on the species that we wanted them to feed on. Um, and so I think that's still one of the great unanswered questions in, in kind of this field of invasion ecology is we still don't really know why uh, that that happens. In fact, Ventanata, which is it's a big deal. I didn't touch on that as much. Uh, it was petitioned as, a, as an endangered species in parts of its native range in, in Europe. And it is rapidly expanding here in the western U.S. Uh, there's some good genetic data from Washington State University that says that we kind of got unlucky with the cheatgrass genetics that we got. Uh, cheatgrass is also introduced into habitats in New Zealand that are very similar climatically to ours. It's just kind of a nuisance weed in, in roadsides. It does not move as well into natural areas. And the genetics that we got, um, Lynn Kenter was at Washington State University that did this research. She did a lot of comparisons between that was introduced in New Zealand to ours, and ours is just much more aggressive under the same situations. Um, there's a bunch of different hypotheses for why that might be the case, but it's probably just its point of origin in Europe. So, great question, and probably a long-winded answer. Sir, your hand was up next. So what effect do the fires have on the sage grouse? Great question. Um, directly or indirectly? So um, directly, d direct habitat loss. So uh, depending on the time of the fire. Uh, so we were doing some work this year on, on a number of those large fires that occurred in eastern Sheridan County, looking at sage grouse leks that occurred within those fires. Um, they, pr they have pretty high site fidelity, although there, there's some newer research that suggests that they'll kind of switch leks or, or places that they dance around to try to pick up chicks basically uh, they'll move a little bit more than, than we thought they did uh, but so the immediate impact directly after a fire is they lose hiding cover they lose that the, the species that they would depend on through the winter because a large portion of their diet in winter is primarily sagebrush so if you lose a sagebrush component there's really immediate impacts to their habitat. Longer term, if we go back to the fact that if we have a bunch of annual grasses that are facilitated by fire, we, we lost sagebrush already. If we continue to lose diversity of other species, we lose things like forbs that are important not only for the chicks to eat, but also for habitat for the insects that those birds live on. Then um, I guess the short answer to your, your question is if there's fires that lead to invasive annual grass dominance is terrible for sage grouse. I mean it's probably it's probably the worst case scenario for sage grass habitat. Great question. Uh, sir? It's a great question. So did you guys hear that back there? So what kind of time frame are we looking at before the, the, the native remnant perennials can recover? 
can I waffle and say it depends? Um, so so it depends. So one, if there's, we talk a lot about recovery potential. So oftentimes you'll drive by these places. It looked like there's nothing there but cheatgrass. But if you get down and dig underneath it, there's a bunch of little suppressed perennial plants that are growing. So if there's sufficient recovery potential that those perennials can come back from existing root stock, um, we've seen we've seen dramatic increase in in perennial plant growth, um, especially from a grass and forb standpoint. The year after we do an application, twice as much plant growth, three times, four times as much plant growth given given conditions. Um, if if those plants have to come back from seed, much different story. Um, and part of that is because if you think about there's this idea about uh, priority effects if you read ecological literature from a seed bank whoever can emerge first and gain those resources more quickly and, and then grow more quickly they're going to kind of win that immediate race of establishment and cheatgrass just hands down is able to do that um, many of our perennial rangeland plants experience episodic recruitment in that conditions are really right for them to recruit from seed maybe once every 10 to 20 years. And so expecting them to just come back when we want them to, it might be expecting a little bit much out of those. So I think the key to your question is if you can implement your cheatgrass or other annual grass management before you've reached the point that you've completely depleted your recovery potential, then I think that it's going to be much more successful. And in the other case, you might have to come in and do some reseeding work uh, like we're trying to do here. This is easy to do on a small plot, e relatively easy. You start trying to do this on 100,000 acres of rangeland, it's rolly country that's steep and you got a bunch of rocks in it. It's much more difficult. So uh, the question was, is it worthwhile for small plot landowners? It depends on your management goals and how much you're willing to invest. And I would argue for, I don't want to be, I don't want to, uh, I don't want to paint with too broad of a brush. For some of all our small acreage type landowners, they need to think through uh, some other management things that they are doing before they start to invest in that kind of approach. So, um, and I get it, I'm, I'm an animal owner myself, but if, if you can't manage your grazing in a sustainable way, it doesn't matter how much you dump into restoring a site. If you've got your animals out there year-round on a small acreage, you're going to have annual weeds on that site. So, all, I mean, all those different things come together. 